Okay, we'll go ahead and get started and welcome to this evening's webinar on polymetary training by Dr. with Dr. Kenneth Reed. I am Dr. Layla Hyshaw, founder and president of Diversity in Dentistry Mentorships, and I am so thrilled that you are joining us tonight for a great training and great information that what we discuss here all the time at our in our organization is as we are building up and nurturing our future leaders in dentistry, we want them to be equipped and confident and ready to lead so that they can truly make a difference um, and elevate our profession and, and our community. So I will start with uh, to introduce Dr. Reed. Thank you again. Uh, Dr. Reed um, is an, on our advisory council, but he's also a, a colleague of mine here in Tucson, Arizona, and a very early, one of the first, Dr. Reed, I really just want you to know how sincerely grateful I am to you of your support in the mentorship program and making sure that we're sharing information and resources and ideas of ways to continue to, uh, to make an impact on our future of dentistry. He is not only, well, he comes today as a certified parliamentarian through the American Institute of uh, Parliamentarians, AIP, and a professional registered parliamentarian, PRP, through the National Association of Parliamentarians. And the full bio, I just wanna let you know, I will put in, the, in um, a link in the chat so you can review it. But when we talk about dentists who are multi-passionate and multi-hyphenated, Dr. Ree comes not only as a dentist, a periodontist, a dental anesthesiologist, an educator, an author, and, um, and also in leadership, but more so a servant leadership. Um, he had graduated from Oregon Health Science University with um, OHSU School of Dentistry in Portland, Oregon, and also stayed there for his, his residency in periodontology and later completed an, a CODA approved dental anesthesia residency at Lutheran Medical Center in Brooklyn. He practiced periodontics and um, for, until 2001 and then um, was treating his patients with dental anesthesia for the past two decades and is now, as, as well as teaching, still practicing part-time in Tucson. Dr. Reed is the Associate Program Director of the Dental Anesthesia Residency and also serves as an attending in anesthesiology at NYU Lagone Hospitals based in Brooklyn, New York. And with the leadership, he, he has shown great leadership as past president of the American Dental Society of Anesthesiology, diplomat of the American Board, Dental Board of Anesthesiology, and serves on the board of directors of the American Dental Board of Anesthesiology as secretary. He's also an author, two textbooks and multiple textbook chapters. And as I said, his servant leadership is demonstrated through mentoring, through diversity and dentistry mentorships, and with Flying Samaritans, a mission to deliver medical care, dental care, and education to underserved remote areas of Baja California, Mexico. And did you know he is also a pilot, licensed pilot and air flight instructor? The list goes on and on. So I better stop there so we can learn about what we are here today, um, learning the parliamentary procedures and basics. And, and this, is, this webinar is for you if you're interested in getting into leadership at any level, um, organization, profit, in order to run a, um, your meetings efficiently, this, you have to have these basic skills. And let's say you're already in leadership and you wanna hone your skills. You're, you're truly uh, in the right place. And so we will get started right, way, right away. And thank you so much, Dr. Reed. I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Well, <laughs> I'll unmute me and I'll turn my volume up if you wanna turn your volume down and mute you. Well, thank you. Uh, all of that stuff just basically says I'm old and I've done this stuff a long time. So um, I did get interested in parliamentary issues in 2019, so it's not that long ago. Um, and I was telling uh, Dr. Hyshaw, I uh, attended a meeting that was miserable. Um, there was one person that knew a little bit more about parliamentary procedure than anyone else and totally, totally screwed up this meeting, totally went off course. I mean, it was really, really bad. And the presiding officer had no clue how to get them back and just lost control of this meeting. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. And I said, you know what? Um, I just got a, a text. Someone isn't hearing. Is audio okay for 
everyone else? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I'll just let. Uh, that was Amanda. Okay. That, she called. Hmm. I, I she she must be the phone one there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I said somebody has to know this stuff, and I'll start reading about it. And the more I read about it, the more I liked it. Uh, it really, really is interesting, especially if you're logical and you like things to make sense and you like for there to be rules, this is the place for you. So let me share my screen and we can go into the, there we go. Ooh, okay, that's tiny up here. Oh, there, there's a speaker here. Okay, so I assume that people can see that, yes? Okay. Um, so I entitled this an introduction to parliamentary law for boards of directors. And again, I'll come back to parliamentary law versus pro parliamentary procedure. Um, today's August 23rd. Um, I just, I looked at some interesting statistics. Um, so the first thing it says there's DMD dentist. There's 180,000 dentists in the U S. So that's interesting. The second one there is, as Dr. Heichel said, I'm a flight instructor, but I also have an airline transport pilot rating. And I looked up ATPs, and there's 160,000 ATPs. Uh, and then I'll tell you about PRPs and CPs a little bit later. But um, that's just kind of the background. Uh, I do have a handout for you all. Uh, it's PDF format. And it's just tinyurl.com and then the DID 2020. So I'll give you a second to either screen capture that or type it in or whatever. Uh, but that is a, oh yeah, and add that to the chat. Okay, great. Very good. So parliamentary law versus parliamentary procedure. Thomas Jefferson noted that parliamentary branch of law is law since its rules are binding upon the assembly and have the effect of law since the courts have ruled organization members who do not obey the rules they adopted and act contrary to them are liable to action in court. So I actually like parliamentary law better than a procedure. Alice Sturgis also said, parliamentary law is the code of rules and ethics for working together in groups. It is logic and common sense crystallized into law and is as much a part of the body of law as is civil and criminal law. So Alice Sturgis was one of the authors of one of the text uh, parliamentary references that I'll mention a few slides from now. So why? Why do we have to know this stuff? What, what good is it? Well, again, Alice Sturgis said, the purpose of a parliamentary procedure is to facilitate the transaction of business and uh, to promote cooperation cooperation and harmony. Essentially, all of these rules and all of these things are to make it easier and better and more efficient. It's not to block things, it's not to uh, do any of that stuff. So it, it's really to allow meetings to go much more uh, smoothly. I was in a board meeting, ADBA, the American Dental Board of Anesthesiology. We had a, a board meeting last night and part of what parliamentarians do is they script meetings, which is basically like writing a play, you know, and this person says this and this person's and it, the entire meeting is scripted out. So my president asked me to script that meeting for her. And it was a 34 minute board meeting. Now, last year under a different president that didn't want scripts, our board meetings would run about three hours. So it really, having a parliamentarian help with the background information can really simplify and uh, streamline all of these meetings and we're not just wasting our time hours and hours and hours. I have a quote from Dr. Hyshaw. <laughs> we want to develop skilled leaders in dentistry and this webinar will provide the foundation needed to conduct business meetings in organized dentistry and nonprofit organizations. If we really want to have decision-making voices on eliminating barrier to dental school admissions and oral health equity at the table, we have to acquire the tools to be confident and successful in achieving this goal. So I thought that that was worth repeating. 
Um, one of my colleagues, uh, parliamentary colleagues is um, Atul. He is a physician. He is a an ER doc in Ottawa, Canada. And he was talking about uh, in Ottawa, they were discussing banning smoking in restaurants in the city. And he, he said, one of my uh, colleagues told the a city can't, City Council that you can save more lives with one vote than I can in a week in seeing a patients in my office. So getting involved, getting on boards, getting uh, attending oh. meetings and knowing how the meeting should progress and being an effective participant, not necessarily leader, but start off as participant and then eventually leader and you will be able to make those changes. The Dalai Lama, I quote next, learn the rules so you know how to break them properly. Now, I would alter that just a little bit and say, learn the rules so that you know how to use them properly, because we don't really have to break rules very often, but if we understand them, then we can use them to our advantage and the advantage of those that we represent. And then Adil again said, most Organizations hire a parliamentarian one meeting after they needed one. And that's exactly what we see. Something really bad happened and they say, we need a parliamentarian now. So it would be great to get to them a little bit earlier, but we're generally not doing that. So let me talk about the two organizations. Um, they're called American and National, but truly they're both international. So the first one here is the National Association of Parliamentarians. There's the website. You can see it's almost 100 years old and there's just over 5,000 members. So it's a, it is very, very large as far as a parliamentarian group. Um, I know that we have a people literally from all over the world. And the parliamentarian uh, NAP, National Association, if you want to be credentialed in that uh, organization, they offer two credentials, a registered parliamentarian and a professional registered parliamentarian. The registered parliamentarian exam has changed a little bit since I took it, but when I took it, it was six separate exams that you had to pass. And then if you did, then you had to wait at least a year before you took the PRP, the professional registered parliamentarian. And that started off with about a hundred hours of background work that you had to write scripts and write agendas and write minutes and all kinds of stuff like that about a hundred hours there. And then it finished with a three day oral exam. That's a long, tough thing to do. <laughs> so there's 354 professional registered parliamentarians in the world, uh, compared that to 160,000 or 180,000. Uh, there's not quite as many, I would say. This is the board of directors of NAP. Um, a lot of the officers of one organization attend the meetings of the other as well. They bring greetings, they update. Um, so I've seen Wanda at a number of, of meetings. She was just at the American Institute of Parliamentarians annual meeting with me uh, two or three weeks ago in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, I've met M Mona, uh, I've met Mary many times. I actually sat next to Lucy at that meeting. Uh, and then Henry Lawton was one of the three examiners for my oral exam for my PRP. So I've met many of these people um, and know them somewhat well. The other group is the American Institute of Parliamentarians. So they're uh, not quite 65 years old, a newer group and a smaller group. So they're 573 members, um, just over 10%. They offered the certified is their credential. So it's registered in NIP, it's certified in AIP. And there are 23 certified parliamentarians. Um, there are 18 certified parliamentarian teachers. There are eight certified professional parliamentarians and 20 certified professional parliamentarian teachers. Again, these are in the world. So pretty small groups. Uh, I do have CP now. I am currently working on my T credential to become a CPT. I would hope to do that by the end of this year. This is the uh, board of directors of AIP. It's a little bit different. AIP, the American Institute of Parliamentarians, is the organization that most medical and dental groups use. So if we go across here, Al Gage is 
the president. He's actually a realtor up in the Phoenix area. Bob Peskin, though, is a dentist. Um, Ramona, I'm not sure what her background is. Daniel's a PhD. Adol, I've already said, is a physician. Um, CJ is the Speaker of the House of the Oklahoma House of Representatives. Helen McFadden's a lawyer, you know, these lawyers, <laughs> Helen and Weldon. Uh, Kay is a professional parliamentarian. Larry, I'm not sure what he did. He's retired. Nilda is also an attorney. I see her at almost all these meetings. Glenn Hall is a dentist. Uh, and then just the last one down here, Valerie is a hygienist. So dentists are very well represented in AIP. We actually created a dental chapter for AIP uh, two or three months ago. So they're, they're both good groups, they're different groups. We'll talk about an adopted parliamentary authority. And that's basically what book are you using? What rules are you following? So let's start off with AIP, the American Institute of Parliamentarian Standard Code of Parliamentary Procedure. So obviously this is the uh, parliamentary authority that AIP uses. My recommendation to you is if you belong to an organization that uses AIPSC, that you buy it as a reference. Don't buy it and read it. It's not real exciting, but buy it to have. And if you're, well, uh, the ADA uses AIPSC, um, all of the dental groups I know of use AIPSC. Uh, so, uh, assuming that you're a member of any of those groups, I would see that um, that just buy one of those, keep it as a reference. In the top, I've got the dash 1410, which means that this particular uh, book is not available in hardback is the first one. Uh, uh, soft cover is the second one and electronic version is the third one. So the AIPSC is available in iBooks and I have the electronic version, I have the a print version. Now bottom left is the year of first publication. So this used to be called Sturgis's Standard Code of Parliamentary Procedure. She died, but her first edition was 1925. And then the bottom right is the current edition, the number of pages. So this is 326 pages. So I would recommend if you're a member of a group that uses AIPSC to have it as a reference. The next one over though is, is the big daddy. This is the, the big dog, uh, Robert's Rules of Order. And it's Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised 12th edition is the full one there. Same concepts, uh, hardback is $27, paperback is 15 for some reason, electronic version is more than paperback. Um, and that's available in uh, Kindle. Uh, it's not iBooks, it's Kindle. Henry M. Robert III is one of the authors. Henry N. M. Robert I uh, in 1876 published the first edition of this textbook or this uh, authority. And the current version is 714 pages. So you can see that Roberts is more than twice as big as AIPSC. About 80% of the world's organizations use Roberts. About 15% of organizations, and almost all of them are medical dental, use AIPSC. And about 5% of all of the world's organizations use something else. So again, if you belong to a Roberts organization, probably your homeowners association or PTA or Elks Club or uh, community center, they, they probably use Roberts. So you, I'm going to recommend that you buy an AIPSC and a Roberts and just have them as references. The far right one is the one I'm going to recommend that you buy and actually read. Uh, and it's Roberts in brief. So it goes over Roberts, but it just hits the highlights. And you can see it's only 213 pages. It's only been offered three times. This is the uh, Third edition just came out last year, and the first edition was uh, 2004. Not available in hardback. Uh, the paperback is $8, and the e electronic version is 9 So not a huge financial hardship to buy that one. About 90% probably of the information is the same in AIPSC and Roberts. 
So if you read Roberts in brief and understand it, you'll know the vast majority of AIP as well. So there's not that many uh, differences, but, but there's actually quite a few. Um, just for a completeness as well, uh, NAP, the National Association, only uses Roberts. That's all they look at. Uh, AIPSC uses Roberts a lot, but obviously uses uh, AIPSC as well. And then there are some other ones. Demeter is absolutely my favorite. I love Demeter. Demeter explains Roberts really well. And you can see uh, the hardcover is $10, the softcover is $20. It's not available electronically. First published in 1948, last published in 1969. So this has not been updated in a long time. 374 pages, but really, really good. So that's, that's kind of my favorite one. And then the last one is going to be Canon. Only published once in 1992. It's 176 pages. And it uh, is available in either hardcover or a paperback, $15, $17. Now, Canon is divided into three parts, part one, part two, part three. Um, I recommend that if you are a presiding officer, a chair, a president, that you buy Canon and read part one. I think it's 70 pages. Um, it really teaches you how to be an effective uh, presiding officer. Uh, it, so it's really, really good. He was actually the parliamentarian for the, I think it was the U.S. Senate, Senator of the House one. I don't recall which for a number of years. So by canon, if you are or are going to become a presiding officer, uh, Demeter. So I would say buy Robertson Brief and read it. If you really, really like it, buy a Demeter and read it and just keep your other ones really as as references and then a canon would be there for you if you're going to be a president of, of something. It really teaches you presiding well. So that's kind of some background. If we have time, these are my topics I'd like to go through today and not in any great detail. So it's mostly one slide on most of these. Uh, occasionally there is a more than that, but there, I'm, I'm just gonna touch on it. Um, if there's anything that you really like in here, I can always do a different meeting and expand on anything that you like, including more than this. So this is just kind of introductory stuff. This is my favorite parliamentary quote of all time, and it goes back to my experience in 2019. It's the duty of the presiding officer to know the rules of parliamentary law and basic parliamentary practice. There is nothing more pitiable than one who is ignorant of parliamentary law trying to pr preside over an assembly. The more intelligent the assembly, the sadder the spectacle. So Demeter said that, and that's really hit home with me. Said, so, yeah, been there, done that, don't want to go through it again. So let's start with hierarchy. Um, what you have to follow in your organization are federal, state, and local laws. So you can't say, well, you know, our treasury is getting down there and we need some more money. Let's go rob a bank. Well, you can't do that, right? So you can't break federal, state, or local laws. Under that is the constitution of the organization. So many organizations have a constitution and a separate bylaws. Uh, the modern way of doing it, though, is to not have a separate constitution, just have a bylaws. But again, many organizations still have those. After that are the bylaws then. So the bylaws are what you write and they're fairly inclusive, but they can't be as inclusive as larger documents. So bylaws are there, then you'll create standing rules. And then standing rules aren't as difficult to amend. They aren't as difficult to accept. Uh, they don't have quite the same power as bylaws, but standing rules, you'll write for various reasons, uh, things that you want to do. It's really, it's administrative things where bylaws are a lot more involved than that. And then under the standing rules are, or is your adopted parliamentary authority. So what are you going to say is our rule book? We, we have this organization. These are our bylaws. They're not going to be complete. They, they can't cover every situation. What do you want to cover it when our bylaws don't? So you'll adopt either AIPSC or Roberts or Demeter or whoever 
you want um, as your adopted parliamentary authority. What I've actually, when I write bylaws, um, I'll write it in into them that this is our adopted parliamentary authority. And in instances where it is not complete, other parliamentary references may be, uh, what's the word I write? Uh, persuasive. So if, if we adopt AIPSC and there's something that's not in there, but it's in Roberts, then we can still use it that way. So, um, and I've noticed that the bylaws of this organization don't specify an adopted parliamentary authority. So that would be one thing to consider doing. And then the last thing is customs. Customs is we've always done it that way. And fortunately, this group is new enough that we don't have 20 or 30 or 40 years of customs. So uh, customs can be done. On, and if there is, say, one of the things that we did in ADBA is it was a custom that when the organization voted for board of directors, that only those that were successful were announced. The actual votes weren't announced, but both Roberts and AIPSC says the actual vote totals should be announced. So this person got this many, this person got this many. So the custom can stand until or unless someone brings it up and says, but our adopted parliamentary authority says this, and then you have to fo follow it. So customs, it's called fall to the floor when uh, they're challenged by a, something that's above that, which could be a standing rule of bylaw, anything like that. So that's kind of the hierarchy of uh, what we follow and, and why and how. One of the terms that I find many people are don't understand well is ex officio. And by reading a lot of different bylaws, I have seen over and over again where I believe they are using ex officio to mean non-voting member. And that's not what, what it means at all. It's by virtue of office held. So an example would be the president is ex officio, a member of all committees except the a Committee on Nominations. So that's fairly common and other things like that. Uh, sometimes the executive director is ex officio. Sometimes the Speaker of the House is. So uh, by virtue of, of that office being held, you are on the Board of Directors. I'm not gonna go through all these motions. <laughs> um, I throw them up here just to say, you know what? There's a lot of motions. Um, Roberts is slightly different. Roberts doesn't have specific main motions. Uh, so that when you get into the nitty gritty of the different books, that there are some differences, but uh, there's only one main motion at a time. So that is gonna be singular, but there's multiple specific main motions. There's multiple subsidiary motions, privilege motions, incidental. Again, what, what you really need as far as the basics are to understand a main motion and amendments, I think. And that's really as far as I'm going to go today. I'm not going to get into specific main motions or, or, or anything after that. But here they are again. Some motions are ranked and some are unranked. And what that means is, let's say, let's pick, let's pick limit or extend debate halfway down on the subsidiary side. So if there's a motion to limit or extend debate, and then someone makes a motion to refer to the com to a, a committee. That motion is not an order because it's of a lower, it's called precedence. But if someone would make a motion to adjourn, that's higher. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that motion could be made. So the ranked motions are exactly there. They're privileged and a subsidiary. The main motion is the lowest ranking motion and privileged are the highest adjourn is highest and then recess question of privilege so on and so on there are some asterisks so there's one by table there's one by postpone to a certain time there's one by amend and there's one by main motion those are the four things i talk about today over on the unranked there's a bunch of stuff and again roberts is a little bit different but there's so many of these things that uh, the average participant in a normal meeting will never have to know this stuff. But if you really start to get into it or if you feel that you need to 
hire a parliamentarian for a very specific reason, um, they will know all of this stuff. So my next slide is CJ. Uh, I, I mentioned a CJ before. He has this little video that he allows me to show. So I'll show his video here. And basically it's the, the six stages of making a motion. My name is CJ Caven. I'm a certified parliamentarian with the American Institute of Parliamentarians and a professional registered parliamentarian with the National Association of Parliamentarians. And I'm excited to share with you some quick tips about how you can have better effective meetings. So there are six basic stages of handling business. It's motion, second, statement by the presiding officer, discussion, a vote, and then the announcement of that vote. And we'll walk through how each of those are handled. So that first step of making a motion, a member who is recognized by the presiding officer introduces a motion, a motion by saying, I move that the organization does this or that. If another member agrees with that motion or thinks that it's worthy of consideration or at least worthy of discussion, a second does not mean that you necessarily agree, just that you think it's something that needs to be discussed. A member can second the motion without rising. A member can say, I second the motion. I second it, simply second, or something such as support, something to give the presiding officer an indication that more than one member wants to discuss the, the, pending, the potential pending question. The third and, and very important step is a statement by the presiding officer. The chair states the motion that is moved and seconded that the organization does this or that and opens it to debate by saying, are you ready for the question? Or less formally, is there any debate? This is a very crucial step in the process because the entire assembly has a right to know what they're discussing. So the statement by the presiding officer is putting the entire assembly, the entire membership present, basically on notice as to what they're about to talk about. Number four is debating the question. After stating the motion, the chair looks towards the maker of the motion to see whether he or she wishes to debate first. This is his or her right to claim if he or she wishes. The maker of the motion always gets to go first if, if he or she chooses to. Then if the maker of the motion chooses to debate uh, or, or add discussion or not, then the chair will open it up to other members of the assembly to add their input as well. Once full discussion has been had, when debate appears to have ended, the chair again says, are you ready for the question? If no one responds, the chair puts the question. And by puts the question, I mean takes the vote by saying the question is on the adoption of the motion that the organization does this or that. Those in favor say aye, those opposed say no. Once the vote has been taken, the chair announces the outcome of the vote. The ayes have it and the motion is adopted or the noes have it and the motion is lost. The chair then should add a brief explanation of the resulting action or the steps which will be followed in order to carry out the decision just made. Action is action on the pending question is not complete until the chair has announced the result of the vote and gives the resulting action. For example, the ayes have it, the motion is adopted, and the organization will do this. Okay. Thank you, CJ. <laughs> um, so that's kind of how things work in either uh, book. So Roberts or um, AIPSC, there, there's always those uh, six stages. So the next one I want to talk about is table, the motion to table, which is used incorrectly about 90 to 95% of the time. So it's one, two that we need to discuss. So first of all, in Roberts, um, the motion is actually called lay on the table. And lay on the table has an M, which means it requires a majority vote. So the motion to lay on the table allows you to put the pending question aside temporarily 
because something came up that needs to be addressed now. A really good example of this is you have a motion on the floor, you're discussing something and you're in debate discussion now. Um, we know that the mayor is going to come and address the assembly, but we don't know exactly what time the mayor is going to get there. The mayor arrives. So a member may move to lay on the table the current motion so that the mayor can speak. Um, or it could be something happened, you know, so, so there's various reasons, but it, it's only laying it aside temporarily. You're going to bring it back again. You bring it back from technically it's called remove from the table. You'll do that later. And the motion is really misused a lot. Um, it may be better to postpone indefinitely. So um, I actually just wrote that motion for a meeting that will occur on Monday night. Um, there's been a discussion back and forth for the last three board meetings on this one particular topic. And one guy has really had enough of it and said, you know what, let's just, I don't want to talk about it anymore and let's just get rid of it. So they will make a motion to postpone indefinitely, which means it goes away basically. Um, or you could postpone to a certain time. So you could uh, postpone it until after lunch, uh, postpone until after the treasurer's report, postpone until tomorrow, next week, next meeting. So um, there are a number of different ways to, to do what you want. Lay on the table is appropriate, but isn't really used that, that, mo that often correctly. In AIPSC, there is actually a motion to table. Now it requires a two thirds vote though, because it essentially, anytime that you need a vote greater than a majority, probably you're taking away rights from members and members rights are one huge thing for me. I, that's my, my big thing. So it, you can take away rights, but enough of the organization must want to do that. And it's handled very differently. So essentially a motion to table an AIPSC suppresses or kills it without further debate. So you can make this motion when something first comes up or during debate, during discussion. Uh, but remember for a general membership meeting, it only requires two people to bring a motion to the floor, right? Someone has to make the motion, someone has to second it. If you, if, if there's a hundred people in this room and 98 people want nothing to do with it, but two people get it on the floor, this would be a great way of getting rid of it. So uh, one of the 98 members can make a motion to table it. It requires a two thirds vote. Uh, if you get that, it basically is just gone though. So it could be something that's objectionable, divisive, it's clearly unwanted. Um, you may not know it right up front. You, you may know it just from the question, just from the, the motion itself, but you may not really understand that, no, we don't want to do this until there's been some a debate. So this just is a quick and dirty way of, of, of saying, no, let, let's get rid of this one. Uh, we don't want to talk about it anymore. It's, it's a little bit different than postpone indefinitely. Okay, another one we are kind of brought in with this whole table thing is postpone to a certain time. So now you want to put off consideration until a certain time. It could be, again, after lunch, it could be after a particular report, it could be uh, on a certain future date, on a certain future meeting, uh, it could be after new business. So whatever you, you want. And again, that doesn't take away a, a member's rights because you're going to talk about it. You're just going, to, going to, to talk about it later. So it is, in fact, a majority vote. And you can only uh, postpone to, if it's going to be to a meeting, to a meeting that's already scheduled. We'll talk about regular meetings. We'll talk about sessions. We'll talk about special meetings. And you can postpone from one regular meeting to another one. And, but there's different rules depending on the book. So AIPSC, there's no time limit. Roberts, it has to be within a quarter, quarter of a year, within uh, three months. And you can't postpone to a special meeting that isn't already scheduled. 
So you can't postpone it to something that doesn't already exist. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about special meetings and regular meetings coming up shortly as well. Okay, any questions so far? Let's just take a little break here since we're changing gears a bit. Uh, I can't see everyone, so if, if if anybody has chats or if anybody has hands raised. What? No? no. no it's been interesting. I, I never heard of postponement. Oh, you know, okay, great, yeah. In a bazillion, I, I, in a bazillion uh, parliamentary, supposedly parliamentary procedure meetings. Never heard of that. Right. And one of the, you know, there, there's so much need for parliamentary education and there's so few people credentialed that most of the people serving as parliamentarians aren't credentialed and there's, they self study or they don't study or they make up crap and, and you just don't know. So, yeah, um, so many meetings could be a lot more efficient and yeah, these are the rules. So, yeah, that's great to bring that up. What's that? Unmute. I was going to unmute you. Yeah. Can you hear me on this? I think they. Can you guys hear me from the other computer? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Well, I was just wondering um, on the postponing to to kill indefinitely kill the motion. Postpone indefinitely. Uh -huh. Right. Indefinitely. Yes. What is the advantage? I mean, I guess it would save a step than letting it go all the way to the vote just for it to fail when we know it's going to fail. If you know the majority of people just want to kill it. Yeah, partly it's let's not waste any more time on this and let's get rid of it. Partly it's that you don't want a vote on it maybe sometimes mm. because it's so divisive or, or, or something, you know, you just want it shown in the minutes that we got rid of it because mm. we don't want any part of this. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Yeah. Okay. Let's go on to amendments then. Uh, um, amendments get really hairy. So I, I'm going to. Make them as simple as I can, uh, and I'm not going to go really fancy here, but you can amend a main motion. Okay, so if you do that, it's, it's called a primary amendment and the words that are used are, it must be germane to the motion. So it must relate directly to the motion. Now, being germane can be just the opposite. So if, if you say something about um, we want to buy ice, you can change it to we want to buy fire. You know, so, mm -hmm. so as long as it's germane, it, it can still be an amendment. It can totally change the motion, though. So then once you have this primary amendment, and I've got an example on the next slide, so it's coming up. Um, you can actually amend the amendment. Mm -hmm. So now it's called the secondary amendment. And again, it has to relate to both the main motion and the primary amendment. And fortunately, amendments of the th third rank are not in order. So you can't do a tertiary amendment. We've got primary and secondary only. Now, also only one amendment of each rank can be pending at one time. So you can have a main motion and a primary, but if, if you want to amend it again, it has to be secondary. It can't be it can't replace the primary, so you can't have two primaries. Um, whenever a secondary is pending, you can't make a second secondary, so just like primary. Um, and then you will debate on the pending amendment. So if there's only a motion, you'll debate that. If there's an amendment, you only debate the amendment, no, not the motion. And if there's a secondary, you only uh, debate the secondary until you clear it to go back to the primary, to go back to the main motion. Okay, so here's an example. I move that the organization purchase a facility for the purpose of providing continuing education courses. Okay, so that's a main motion. Someone could offer a primary amendment that says, I move that we insert the words in Tucson after facility. So then what the presiding officer would say if adopted, the primary amendment would read that the organization purchase a facility in Tucson for the purpose of providing continuing education courses. There can be debate and vote on that, or somebody can come up and, and, and offer a secondary a movement and say, I move that we insert the word South before Tucson. Again, it's germane to both the primary and the main motion. 
then assuming that happens, the presiding officer would say, if adopted, the secondary um, amendment would read that the organization purchased a facility in South Tucson for the purpose of providing continuing education courses. So then you vote on that secondary amendment, South Tucson, either it's approved or not. If it is, it goes back as the primary, but if it's defeated, you go back to the original one. So if it, if it is adopted, the primary becomes South Tucson. If it's defeated, South does not get entered and it just goes back to Tucson. And amendments then are voted on the reverse of the proposal, right? So you propose a motion, you propose a primary amendment, you propose a secondary amendment. If there is a secondary amendment, you have to vote on it first. It passes or it fails. Then it goes back to the primary. It passes or it fails. And then it goes back to the main motion as amended or not, and it passes or fails. Amendments are always majority votes. A motion is majority or two thirds, depending on what it's doing. So if it's just a regular motion, it's gonna be a majority vote. If it's going to be a motion that limits members' rights, it's gonna be a two thirds vote. So there's a whole chart of everything. I actually created a chart that AIPSC is going to use on on that and ranking and all that stuff. Well, if the organization has bylaws that specifically state if you're voting on anything financial, mm -hmm. it has to be two thirds. Is that could be customized for organization? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So any bylaws that exist supersede the parliamentary authority. Okay. So these are all a parliamentary authority stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And in fact, in bylaws, you can write anything you want. You can write bylaws that take away every member's rights, essentially. Now, you can't do that in the adopted parliamentary authority, but your bylaws uh, supersede them. And, and, and you can say, we're going to take away these rights. And I don't like that, no. but, but you can, as long as it doesn't violate federal law, stuff like that. So I've been in meetings where a motion was made, but then after discussion, then they realized they should have restated it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you do that versus yeah. going through the primary amendment? So a, a couple things that CJ said that um, I wanted to follow up on as well, is he talked about um, seconding. I second it, second, and he gave a bunch of different ways of doing it. And essentially, a presiding officer uh, wants the business to be conducted efficiently. So if we're in an organization that uses AIPSC, and if you use Robert's terms, I'll restate it for you as AIPSC. So we, we want it to, to work out. And just because you use the wrong word, we know what you mean so we can still go forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was one of the things that CJ said, what else did he say? There are two or three things in there that I wanted to follow up on and I don't recall right now. Um, but what he did was, was really good though, that little presentation. Okay, so oh, a sure, ask okay. away. So the parliamentary procedure is in the absence of specific bylaws. Um, bylaws are supersede the adopted parliamentary authority. The adopted parliamentary authority, I like to think of as a rule book. So you may have bylaws like you have for this organization and your bylaws don't have an adopted parliamentary authority right now. So essentially I equate that to saying that there's a bunch of people sitting around um, a table that, that agree to be here. So it could be in your board meeting, it could be playing cards. Mm -hmm. And there's a deck of cards. And alternatively, there's a group of people. And someone starts dealing cards. And you look at the cards, and one guy's playing poker, and one guy's playing go fish and one guy's playing something else. So I think of the adopted parliamentary authority as the rule book. What rules are we playing? What game are we playing? Um, so that's kind of a broad term. And then specifically, what's right for your organization? Often the majority of stuff in an adopted parliamentary authority is right for your organization, but not always. So you can say, you know what? Yeah, I understand that. But for our group, this is better. Mm -hmm. So that's the primary uh, uh, indication for the bylaws, I think, is to say what's different about our group. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And you don't have to answer. There was 
the question for me to will you restate that question? And the question before was so the parliamentary procedure is in the absence of specific bylaws. Yeah, if if the bylaws don't address something. Oh, but you, you just have to yeah. say it. Yeah. Um, so, if it's not in the bylaws, the parliamentary authority is broader and should cover it. Mm -hmm. But that's one reason I also write if our adopted parliamentary authority doesn't cover it, we can use other ones as well. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Ken, at what point after the primary motion has been seconded, um, uh, at, at what point in the steps is it then appropriate to offer um, um, an amendment? At any time. So, at any time. Um, yeah, just a picture like uh, the ADA House of Delegates. And there is a motion um, and there's a two microphones, right? There's a, a pro and against normally you'll stand up at a microphone. When it comes to be your turn, you can debate or you can offer amendments and essentially when you're given the floor you're given the ability to do anything that's proper so amendments uh, can be done pretty much anytime thanks anything else i can't see right now because dr highshaw is out of the room but um we will oh yeah was there anything else we had a Mm -hmm. Verbal question that I've answered, so okay. I don't know if there's anything else in the chat or since I can't see them. Okay, yeah. so amendments get kind of tricky, um, but really a main motion, primary amendment, secondary amendment, that'll get you through the vast majority of meetings. So some concepts here, um, bylaws and standing rules, amendments or writing them become effective immediately upon adoption. So if you pass a bylaws amendment at this meeting, it's effective right this minute. Mm -hmm. um, it's possible to eliminate positions in bylaws. It's possible to do a lot of different things. And you may, as an example, eliminate uh, the position of secretary and say, no, nah, the executive director is gonna do that job. Write that into your bylaws. The secretary that's at that meeting no longer secondary. <laughs> so it's instantly upon adoption. Now you can say it will take effect at a different date. So, so you can say this is what we're going to do. It's going going to become effective January first. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then that gets in the scope and notice that I'll come back to as well, which is really fun as well. Uh, so standing rules, we'll talk about it at some point. Probably not in this presentation, but uh, administrative rules, and then there can be special rules of order. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff like that. So there's two broad ways of running meetings. And in part of this, I will absolutely blow your mind by saying you don't need the, any seconds. And so 90% of the meetings I go to, you don't need a second. And that just People can't comprehend that because they've been doing seconds forever. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so we'll get to that in a slide or two. So there's two different ways of running a meeting, and they operate under different rules. So one is a general membership meeting, you know, ADA House of Delegates type stuff, uh, or any membership meeting where the entire membership is invited. And that's a more formal way of doing business in committees and boards is a less formal way. But here's the more formal way. The presiding officer speaks of themselves in the third person. Mm. So your chair does this and this, and that. it's kind of more formal. Um, the chair must rise while recognizing a member to speak and when putting the question to a vote. So when you take the vote and when you recognize um, a member to speak, they have to rise. Members should stand when seeking the floor and while making motions or speaking. And motions now in the general membership meeting must be seconded unless it comes out of a committee of more than one person. So it's it's, it's also possible to have a committee of one person. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it comes out of a committee, it's already assumed to be seconded because there's more than one member of that committee. Mm -hmm. So that's general membership meetings. This continues, 
Discussion of a subject is not permitted while no motion is pending. So you must have a motion to discuss. You, you can't just talk about things. So in, again, things are formal. Um, I, I want to do this. I want our organization to do this. So I move that our organization does this. Then we can uh, talk about it, but we can't just start, you know, one person uh, talks about this and one person uh, talks about that. You never get anything done. The chair in a general membership meeting is or is required, I guess, to be neutral. The chair has no opinion, essentially. So because of that, the chair may not engage in debate unless they leave the chair. So the chair, if they, if, if they really have to debate this topic, it's so important to them, they can leave the chair to the vice president or president-elect, have them be a temporary chair, and then they can go and speak on something. And then once, once the vote is done, then they can come back and take over the mm -hmm. chair again. But it's really rare that a chair would want to leave the chair and debate mm -hmm. as possible. And this last one, many people also get this one wrong for a couple of different reasons, but the president, again, president, presiding officer, chair, all mean the same thing, may only exercise the right to vote when the vote is by ballot, because now remember the chair has to be neutral. And if it's by ballot, it's a secret vote. So no one knows how the chair voted. So that makes sense. Or when one more vote could alter the outcome. Mm -hmm. What I often hear is, the president may exercise the right to vote when it's by ballot or to break a tie. That's not true. The president can vote to make a tie. And if he makes a tie, then it's not a majority and that motion does not pass. And, <laughs> and it doesn't end there. Remember some votes require a two thirds vote. So, if there's one vote less than two thirds, the chair can then, because everyone else has voted and they're not influencing the vote, they can then vote to make it a two thirds, which makes it pass. So interesting stuff. Yeah, <laughs> stuff you don't want to think about. Okay, now different in, in a small board meeting or a committee. Committees and small boards are very similar, but not exactly the same, but they're really, really close. So in a board meeting with nine, about a dozen or fewer, so that's nine is what AIPSC says, and Robert says about a dozen. So that's why both of them are in here. So according to AIPSC, in a board meeting with nine or fewer members, board members, a lot of the formality is not necessary. And the rules are different. There are no seconds. So that's most of my meetings or board meetings or a committee meetings. And there are no, um, you can. So if you choose to run a small board or a committee with the more formal rules, you can do that, but it really is clunky. So I, I recommend not. So in the general membership a meeting, no discussion is allowed un unless there's a motion pending in a board or a small a committee, you can't. So informal discussion is allowed. And you don't have to be as formal as far as standing up and stuff like that. You can just raise a hand or something. Um, you, so it's less formal there. And in fact, now the chair without leaving the chair can speak in discussions in a debate and vote. Um, Within a committee meeting now, well, both of them, the chair can actually make a motion as well. In committee, they're always free to do that. In a board, they're free to do that unless it's brought up that a different member doesn't want it to happen. So you can do it unless you're told that you can't, mm -hmm. is, is the bottom line there. So the chair, the president, uh, presiding officer in a small board pretty much is the same as anyone else. And that's a really neat thing. So then are formal minutes necessary or is going to be votes? Yes. Well, it depends. In a board meetings require a, a minutes. Committees do not. Mm -hmm. As a general rule, I recommend not having a minutes for committee meetings unless it's a really important committee. Mm -hmm. Just because it's just not that important. 
what's really important in a committee meeting is what comes out of committee, either mm -hmm. a report or a motion. So that will be in the minutes eventually. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is a true democracy. So majority rules. Um, it's, it's not variations of that at all. Um, another thing that many people misstate is the second part here. If not otherwise qualified, majority vote is defined as more than half of the legal votes cast by members present and voting. This is AIPSC. Roberts is slightly different, but the same concept. So there are no absentee ballots. There are no, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of where you uh, give someone your vote? No proxies. Yeah, there are no proxies. Again, unless it's written at the bylaws. So mm -hmm. the bylaws can say you can do these things, but if it doesn't say that, you're both parliamentary authorities say that you can't. So they must be present and voting. If they're in a meeting and in the restroom, they don't get a vote either. So, um, and then it is more than half. I often hear half plus one. It's not the same. <laughs> half plus one is not more than half. So as an example, if you have 100 votes, 100 members present and voting, 100 votes, a majority is what? It's 51. What if there's uh, 101 votes? What's a majority? Well, see, if, if you take uh, half plus one, it's 50, yeah, it's, it's 50 and a half plus one is 51 and a half, which has to be rounded up to 52, mm -hmm. but truly it's 51. So 51 over 50 is more than half. So if, if it's an even number of votes, either way is fine. But if it's odd, it's not half plus one. So these little things that we do. Uh, and it doesn't need it. <clears throat> in fact, yeah, so I'm gonna see that here. <laughs> so so many of our meetings, especially for our organization where we're all over the United States, mm -hmm. being present can mean virtually as Oh, well. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or even on the phone. Yeah. So, so the concept of a virtual meeting to be valid is all members must have bi directional oral communication, a U R A L. So you must be able to hear and speak. Mm -hmm. You don't have to see, but yeah, you, you must be able to. So the old conference calls were where that came from. So we don't have to like add that into the bylaws. No, uh, it, it's a good idea to add a section on electronic meetings, and I've done that for or, uh, different groups, so it's easy enough to do. Yeah, that's not a big deal. Okay, good check. Okay, good, <laughs> good, good. Okay. Oh, so and the bottom one, you really should require at least a majority vote to decide anything. There are different ways of doing things, and a way that's more efficient but not better in uh, say you're voting for board of directors and say that you have six people running for uh, four places. Um, a majority vote can be a little bit difficult sometimes that way. And you may end up reballoting. You may end up reballoting a couple times. So what some organizations do is they allow a plurality. So a plurality isn't necessarily a majority, it's just the most votes. Mm -hmm. So the top two or whatever positions, the top two vote getters are elected. Mm -hmm. Neither may have a majority, though. So where I see that in bylaws, I, I uh, suggest that they write that out and put in a majority. Exceptions. I've said this before. Basically, if it involves the rights of a member, it's probably going to take more than a majority vote. Almost always, if it is more, it's two thirds. It could be 60%, it could be 90%, it could be unanimous. So again, you can write anything in the bylaws that you want. The ones though that are common are suspend the rules. The rules are there for a reason and suspending them interferes with a member's rights. Limit debate, again, you have a right to a debate, close debate and table. Um, and again, it just goes back to uh, the more than a majority also for to protect the rights of those that aren't there. So, uh, as an example, bylaws amendments almost always can be 
amended by a two-thirds vote and almost always requires advance notice. And then notice is a totally separate concept now too. So the easiest way here is notice for a meeting. And there's a very specific way that you have to calculate it. So if you need a 30 days notice, uh, you count all calendar days, including holidays and weekends, but you exclude the day of the meeting, but you include the day it's sent. Mm -hmm. And there's a, it's, it's cheap, I, it's not free, but it's cheap. There's a thing called Magic Gavel that I think is $5 or something like that. But on here, there's a notice calculator that you put in your meeting date, your days a notice, and it tells you the last date to send your notice. I use this all the time. It's only for deck and general meetings. Uh, for any time that notice is required. So usually bylaws, amendments, notices required. Um, it just depends on on what your bylaws say, but um, uh, uh, so as an example, in an organization I'm involved with, you, you can call a regular meeting with ten days notice mm -hmm. and a special meeting with five days notice. So there's yeah days notice for many different types of things. Then there's scope of notice. So not only the timing but the scope, and this one's really important too. So it protects members' rights that aren't there. Um, you give notice that we are going to do this. And you think, you know what, it's not that big a deal. And I've got my kid's baseball game. I'm going to uh, go to it. So if a member chooses to not go based on the scope of the notice, you can't then at the meeting open it up and say, well, we're going to talk about all these things. The guy would say, well, if I had known that, I would have been there. So that's why scope of notice is important. It protects absentees. And the actions then that are between what, what exists now, status quo, and the proposal are within that scope of notice. So my little uh, example at the bottom, if an organization's bylaws set the number of members of the board at nine, notice was given to reduce it to five, any amendment between five and nine is okay. But you can't go down to three and you can't go up to 12. So that's scope of notice in that instance. Um, then there's, uh, I think a slide after this, I, I come back to scope again. Regular meetings and special meetings. Uh, Robert uses the, the term session, AIPSC does not. So if you just use meetings, you're always gonna be okay. Um, and if it's a regular meeting, which normally are going to be scheduled out sometime in advance. I know many times it's a year. We know when we're going to meet for the next year, whether it's quarterly or monthly or weekly. Um, and those are regular business meetings. In regular business meetings, you can talk about anything that's legal for your business. So uh, there is no scope, essentially, for regular meetings. Uh, unless, again, your bylaws say something like the officers are elected at the annual meeting, then you have to follow that. Um, but anything that's legal to discuss, if it's not on the agenda, the agenda item, there will be one that says new business. So and anything can come up there. Actually, a Demeter uh, suggests that you not put new business on there at all. And it goes into, a, he's got a, a really good reason, but I don't think it's, it's as valid. Then special meetings. Special meetings you call for special reasons. So usually it's something that can't wait for the next regular meeting. Uh, so if it's monthly or quarterly, and I, we really need to talk about this, something urgent came up, then uh, a special meeting is called. Now, when you call the meeting, which is basically when you give the notice of the meeting, you have to set the parameters, basically. You have to say, this is what we're going to discuss, and that's all you can discuss. There cannot be new business. Uh, you cannot discuss anything that is not on that original agenda. Usually it's one item, but it could be a two or three, but uh, you can't add anything there at all. So that's one difference. Another is that the minutes are taken, but the minutes are not read or approved at the beginning of a special meeting, only regular meetings. But then at the next regular meeting, you do in fact read and approve the special one that you just had. With respect to minutes, there's only two things that you can do with a minutes. Either you approve them or you correct them. You don't have any other option. <laughs> so either you correct them or you approve them. 
Um, you can't say, I don't agree with that. We're, we're not going to prove it. Well, no, either you prove it or you correct it. So those are your only two options. Uh, okay, so special meetings now. And it, it goes back to now scope of the special meeting and how you word it. Really important as well. So you have to say uh, if one of the purposes of a special meeting is to discuss X, Y, and Z then you can discuss X, Y, and Z. Can't vote on it, can't take any action on it. So you have to be very specific and say, we will discuss and vote on, or we will discuss and uh, refer or something, but you, you have to be very, very specific. And they also say you cannot be broad. You can't just say any other business that's proper. So special meetings are different and they're very defined and they do have some uh, tighter rules. Old business, don't use old business. Old business essentially says opening up to things that were uh, already decided years ago, right? That's old business. So someone could bring up, you know, there was a motion in July of 1972 that I want to amend. Well, that's old mo old business. So well, we don't talk about that. We only are talking about now unfinished business. So unfinished business is valid to bring up again. Um, this specifically is AIPSC. Uh, this slide uh, in Roberts, it's a lot broader. But in AIPSC, there's only two things that can be unfinished business. It's something that you were discussing when the previous a meeting adjourned. Meetings, many of them have start times and finish times. And if it starts at seven and finishes at nine, you're done at nine. And you may be talking about something. So that's unfinished business or anything that was specifically postponed to the next meeting. If you don't specifically postpone it, just because it's on the agenda or you talked about it, it's not unfinished business. It has to come up under new business again. So that's kind of interesting that AIPSC is really, really specific. There's only two items that could be unfinished business. Unanimous, unanimous consent does not mean what most people think it means either. So it does not mean that every member hasn't voted in favor of it, only that no one voted against it. I've been losing it. You know, it's obvious that my position is not going to be accepted. They're going to vote the other one, and I just don't vote at all. So it could be unanimous consent. I don't agree with it, but I know I'm not going to win, so I don't, don't wish people stop. I can't it still goes through a vote, but when they say it was opposed, then you're just silent. So I'll, I'll come to abstentions too in just a little bit about when you shouldn't, should not have, uh, um, abstain. Okay, no one voted against it. Um, oh, here it is. Abstentions. So the first two are concepts. Hmm? Advance the slide. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. The first two are generalities, the third one, talks about the first two. So if you're at a meeting, it's a small local gathering that every member votes for their own interest. Say it's a hiking club and there's 12 of you and you're going to vote on where are we going to do our hike next Saturday? So every member votes solely for their own interests. You don't need a parliamentarian for that. Um, however, if you're voting and representing other members, like you're a delegate to a convention, you're a member of a board of directors representing your uh, constituents. Uh, there's a better reason uh, to have a parliamentarian a present then. And then uh, Luis Cuesta, he's a PRP, does a lot of lecturing. Uh, this last line is his quote. The voting members in the former situation up on top have every right to abstain. The voting members in the latter situation have an obligation to abstain from abstaining. <laughs> so if you represent people, you have an obligation to vote, but basically. Uh, we're almost there. Violations of parliamentary law, the first ones, but not the last one. So speaking without being recognized is big. Directing comments to another member and not through the chair. So everything has to go up through the chair. Uh, stating any disrespectful comments to or about another member is absolutely not allowed. You can't even mention another member by name in debate. 
you would have to say the gentleman that last spoke mm -hmm. or the lady from R Rhode Island. So you need to be very not impersonal and just debate the subject. Um, not following the bylaws, standing rules, or parliamentary authority. The last one is not a violation, it's just a shame. Not engaging in debate because you don't know the rules. So ask someone if it's during a meeting, ask the chair. Uh, you know, I think debate has gone on long enough. We're just repeating ourselves. How do we stop? Mm -hmm. And well, you, you do this by making motion to limit debate. Yeah. So so ask the chair, or if it's outside a meeting, ask the a parliamentarian, you know, I was thinking about this and, and how do I, I make this happen? So we we are more than happy to walk you through all that stuff. Top things you can't do, suspend the bylaws. You can't suspend the bylaws. Now there's, the more you get in the weeds, kind of you sort of can under very specific circumstances, but bottom line, you can't. I actually had a presiding officer one time send me a text in his meeting saying, how do I suspend the bylaws? I said, you can't, <laughs> so you can't suspend it. The other one is allow one member to call the question. So in Roberts, it's previous question is the a terminology. In AIPSC, it's close debate and vote immediately. It doesn't matter. The concept is uh, a presiding officer that doesn't understand this, you may have a member, debate has gone on and you know what, we just want to vote. And a member says that they want to call the question or call the previous question, whatever. The presid presiding officer takes the vote. And no, that's not the way it works. You can't, that's not how it works. So what you have to do is have a second, first of all. And then since it takes away members' rights, the right to vote, then it requires a two thirds vote. Do you want to call the question two thirds vote? If two thirds do, then the question has been called and then called on it. But I see this all the time that someone calls the question and you vote on it and you can't skip those other two steps. Now, in Roberts, you can only speak twice, AIPSC, there is no limit. Um, so if you want to do something else, either you have to suspend the rules, which is a two-thirds vote, or consider informally, which is just a majority vote. So slightly different ways of getting there. Okay, I'm done with that stuff. I've got a test for you coming up. I've got some slides. So whoever wants to... Put it in the chat or just yell it out. Uh, for the following slides, state whether the concept is related to conduct in an assembly. So an assembly is going to be your general membership meeting, or if it's a board of directors meeting, which is gonna be a small meeting, less than nine or 12 uh, members, okay? So who wants to take the first one? Motions must be seconded. Is that assembly or board? Assembly, right? Yeah. That's the assembly. All right. There is no limit to the number of times a member can speak to a debatable question. That's the board. That's a board, right? Okay. And my general concept is is it formal or not formal? Formal is assembly, not formal is the board. Presiding officer speaks of themselves in the third person. Assembly. Assembly. Good. The chair need not rise while putting questions to vote. Board. Board. There you go. Okay. Let's go into some more. Members may raise a hand instead of standing when seeking to obtain the floor. Board. Board. No limit to the number of times a member can speak to a debatable question. I thought I changed that, but okay. <laughs> That's the board. Okay, yeah, I, I, I changed that to consists of 9 to 12 members because I just asked it in the previous slide. Uh, but yeah, 9 to 12 members or less is a board. How about informal discussion is permitted? Board. And the chair may not engage in a debate without temporarily leaving the chair. It should be assembly. That's assembly. Very good. So you guys are good. How about members? Address only the chair or uh, or address each other through the chair. That's an assembly. Yep. Assembly. No one is entitled to the floor a second time in a debate on the same motion on the same day as long as any other member who has not spoken desires the floor. Assembly. 
Yep, that sounds really formal to me. Uh, a member may speak only twice to a, a debatable question. Oh, I guess we already did that one too. Uh, each member may speak once in debate on appeals, and the chair may speak twice. Assembly. Sounds like that's pretty formal. I, okay, I think I've got one more set, and, and that's it. Operates much like a committee. Board. Board. Discussion of any subject is permitted only with reference to a pending motion. Assembly. Assembly. The chair should vote only to make or break a tie or when the vote is by ballot. Assembly. And if the chairman is a member, he may, without leaving the chair, speak in informal discussions and in debate and vote on all questions. Board. Look how much you yeah. learned tonight. <laughs> All right. So those those were my slides, and that's my presentation for you. Dr. Reed, oh, 